Uh, my name is uh, Susanne Bronson and I would uh, like to thank the Estonian Centre for Ar Rural Architecture very much for the opportunity to come here today and to talk about my research. Um, my research is still ongoing and work in progress, but I hope I can give you a little bit of an insight today uh, what I'm doing. My research is on climate responsive design principles in vernacular farmsteads and settlements in the Baltic Sea area and it's based at the Institute of Architecture at the Department Code Construction and Design at Berlin Technical University but also with the Department of Climate Responsive and Resource Optimized Building at the Potsdam School of Architecture. I don't know about the, the background of, um, of you or that you have but I just want to define some terms about what I'm talking here in terms of the, the sort of motivation for my research. So with growing global concern for the use of energy and resources and associated climate change, of course, architects have a greater responsibility to design buildings that are environmentally sustainable. This term, sustainable development, um, grew in importance after it was used by the Brundtland Commission and it's uh, defined as one of, the, of a development that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The construction industry worldwide is currently responsible for the use of 50% of material resources, 45 to 45% uh, 40 of energy, 60% of fertile land and 70% of wood. <coughs> Therefore, of course, it is vital to consider the design and construction methods of buildings when fighting climate change. Although we are no longer in a position to reverse climate change, we can influence on its progress. Um, the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change states that 30% of baseline emissions are resulting from the residential and commercial building sector. Um, every place around the world, of course, is characterized by different conditions and therefore there's also different starting points for sustainable development. In the Rio Declaration, the local level was commonly identified as the key for sustainable development and therefore we can only find long-term solutions at the local level. Um, the energy consumption of buildings and embodied energy within the construction can be cut by greater use of existing, more site-appropriate technologies and climate-responsive approaches such as passive solar design, high efficiency lighting and appliances, a better use of daylight, uh, better ventilation, passive ventilation and cooling systems, solar water heaters, better insulation, simple detailing um, and so on. Um, before industrialization, mostly only local building materials and knowledge were available and known from experience and we have known from experience that those would meet local conditions and climate best. Um, buildings were skillfully designed to manage heat loss and to prevent damages from wind or precipitation. Sun orientation was considered and sun radiation was harvested in the most effective way. Uh, climate parameters were carefully balanced within the overall design of local architecture. Vernacular architecture, I suppose I don't have to explain the term to most of you here, but for all the others, it's, it, it, it describes an architecture that developed without architects. It's an architecture or building style that grew over a long period of time out of the conditions of its place. And it literally translates as native to. You could say that it describes a state of uh, relative existence. Vernacular architecture, buildings, lose their meaning without their context as they only work and make sense in their original place because they are perfectly adapted. They can also be seen as evolutionary because they are describing a process of self-correction. They are constantly responding and adapting to function, natural forces, climate, local resources, but also culture. Um, of course, they naturally aim to get the most building for the least material, so they are making use of as little resources as possible. Of course, you can imagine how much work it was to fell a tree by hand and so forth, so you think twice if you really need to fell another one. Um, these um, vernacular buildings are usually quite flexible in plan or simple in construction. Some are even designed to be dissembled, put up in another place. They can be added to easily and they can be repaired easily. 
They are there for aiming at longer lifespans. Um, today we are calculating the lifespans of a new building with about 50 years in the normal rating system for sustainable, for sustainable buildings. But uh, considering all the energy and resources needed, this is a super short time frame compared to traditional buildings that sometimes are there for a few hundred years and that have been handed over from generation to generation. It seems that vernacular architecture could hold a lot of solutions to the problem of how, build, how to build sustainable buildings. It seems to reflect the key aspects of sustainability in material and site appropriateness, climate responsiveness, socioeconomic advantages as uh, uh, only local skills, craftsmanship and materials were used, and in adaptability. Um, the use of the vernacular for a new sustainable building is very much in line with current thinking on vernacular architecture. So far, from a research point of view, vernacular architecture has been mostly described and documented, but as uh, the researcher Amos Rappaport puts it, um, the next step should be a problem-oriented, <coughs> comparative, integrative and more conceptual and theoretical stage, and that we should start learning from vernacular design. It means that maybe places like this, like the Open Air Museum or your, your research uh, or Center for Rural Architecture, uh, should leave this museum status as a window to the past, but should start become knowledge databases to be used by architects and home builders or the building industry as well. Um, the, there is a shift in understanding vernacular architecture as a research discipline and uh, some researchers said, like Asquith and Willinger, that we should further the debate on the importance of vernacular architecture studies now and throughout the 21st century, not as a study of past traditions, but as a contribution to new methods, solutions and achievements for the future built environment. Um, Stuart Brandt said that the vernacular process is a systematic framework for evolving concepts and vernacular principles applied to modern day design practice offer new and concrete ways for design to move forward. But of course, with all the enthusiasm, there's also critical voices. Some people said in some cases, certain vernacular techniques that have worked a few hundred years ago are no longer suitable uh, for contemporary buildings, not only for lifestyle reasons, but also for reasons of a growing population or changing economic and political solutions, uh, political situations, sorry. Uh, when we look back to 100 or 100 years ago, <coughs> 150 years ago before industrialization, people have lived under completely different conditions that most of us today would find desirable much longer. When it comes to thermal comfort, we know that rather often the indoor temperature in these old buildings was no more than four to six degrees more than the outside temperature. This is a thermograph from a hall house a traditional barn bio dwelling house in northern Germany. Um, so, we, so we must, I guess, acknowledge that we must take advantage of progressing civilization and especially innovations in technology. Uh, and maybe it's the question of a balance of the local and the global um, that should avoid using the vernacular merely as a facade, but to build up upon its embodied local building knowledge. My study is focusing on identifying underlying climate responsive design principles and vernacular architecture that are able to be adapted, developed further and then applied for different locations around the Baltic. Um, the study is case study based and it will investigate these uh, cl uh, climate responsive strategies on three different scales, which is the first one is the settlement layout and wider settings of buildings into the landscape and buildings in relation to vegetation as well. Um, the second um, scale, if you will, is the typology of the buildings, the orientation, floor plan, organization, volume, shape and so forth. And the third one would be the building parts and construction techniques and materials used. In, in the end really, or the end result would be that I'm aiming at identifying these principles, but also developing a toolkit of design strategies that can be applied into design of new local climate adapted architecture. This toolkit could also be translated uh, into local design guidance for architects or home builders. Um, climate is one of the most important factors that 
affect both architectural design and urban planning. It is part of the history of mankind to search for ways to protect or benefit from natural climatic conditions. Building shelter was crucial for surviving. Traditional buildings, therefore, have been significantly influenced by local climate in creating comfortable indoor and outdoor environments for living and working. Um, there is a very complex interaction of climate responsive design principles such as orientation, settlement layout, building shape, floor plan organization, use of materials and construction techniques, which is key to this to climatic architecture. So all these principles work together in a very complex way and I'm trying to understand how. Uh, so when considering climate and planning and architectural design, uh, many theoretical concepts and practical approaches are interfering. There are actually no standardized guidelines for climate responsive design and there is a different understanding for climatic design in various countries. The current focus on uh, energy efficiency in buildings has led to a pro proliferation of new technical terms and a mix-up of older definitions. And in my study I'm referring to climatic architecture and climate responsiveness. Um, climate responsive design actually was defined by a researcher named Hastings in 1989 and seeing the building as an environmental filter. It seeks to balance the exclusion of unwanted forces and the admittance of beneficial ones. According to him, the emphasis is lying on the building being an intermediate between indoor and outdoor environment. Climate conscious design stresses the awareness of local climate factors and influences, but it's not presenting an autonomous principle. The problem is that it has to fit in with current design practice, planning policies and regulations. Um, the consideration of climate responsive design principles is currently presenting a challenge to architects. We have forgotten how to build uh, in certain places. And in the absence of local climate related design guidance, the introduction of another variable into the highly complex design process, which it is already, might even require an extra design stage. Um, as Hausladen puts it, a, a German researcher, the architecture of the future will need to be based on detailed climatic analysis, taking into account the impact of solar radiation, temperature, precipitation and wind on buildings. This becomes obviously especially crucial as the 21st century is characterized by climatic changes. In the Baltic Sea region, <coughs> warming is likely to even exceed the global average, so we will suffer even more, particularly in winter and in the northern parts uh, of the area. The warming will be accompanied by a general increase in winter precipitation, but in summer precipitation may either increase or decrease with a chance of drying in the southern than northern parts of the region. Despite the increase in winter precipitation, the amount of snow is generally expected to decrease. As a smaller fraction of the precipitation falls as snow and midwinter snow melt episodes become more common. Changes in windiness are very hard to predict, but most projections uh, are suggesting an increase in average wind speeds. Climatic extremes are also projected to change um, for example, the lowest winter temperatures are expected to warm even more than the winter mean temperature and so forth. So in general we can say that wind speeds will be picking up, winters will get warmer, we will see more precipitation in shorter periods of time, so heavier rain if it rains. Um, so this is from the European Environmental Agency and you can read what's being um, prognosed for our corner of the world. So where I'm coming from, from uh, also an island in the Baltic, Rügen, um, I have experienced that summers already have been becoming much, much warmer and drier. The last two winters we have hardly seen any snow. I think we had snow for one hour. There have been many severe storms. Uh, we are used to strong winds, but these storms have actually caused damages and storm flooding. And when it is raining, it is raining more and more heavily than it has in the past. Uh, so this is a picture from my, from my hometown, Stralsund. Uh, 
And it has become uh, normal that the harbour area is flooded several times in winter because of storm flooding. Um, the, the coastal areas of the Baltic are the most populated areas and they are experiencing, uh, experiencing the so-called coastal climate which reaches up to 100 kilometers inland. Um, so my, my study is really focusing on this, especially on these areas. Thermically uh, driven effects as the land sea breeze and orographically induced flows are a prominent feature. Um, and together with the uh, coastal cloud <coughs> system and fog, low level winds, land falling storms and coastal fronts, this climate is even more extreme um, than maybe a little bit further inland. Uh, for research purposes and also to be able to compare different housing typologies and their um, climate responses or responsive strategies around the Baltic, uh, I have divided the Baltic Sea area into three sub-regions based on environmental parameters. I have used the um, so-called European environmental stratification as a basis. That is not only taking into account the climate, but also other environmental parameters. The very interesting thing is that during my research, I have found that the borders of different vernacular building type apologies actually are correlating with these um, different environmental zones. So I've called these areas the southern, the central and the northern Baltic area based on the continental, the moral and boreal zone. Uh, for all of these areas I have collected case studies, uh, case study material from literature, local archives, also from places like this, open air museums, all around the Baltic. And there are case studies that I'm looking at for a big, at a bigger scale, settlement layouts, but also case studies of single farmsteads and single buildings, focusing on dwelling buildings mostly. For the detailed building part, I'm using more general knowledge of local building techniques and construction material. Um, when, when examining these case studies, I've started to ask myself, uh, how vernacular are these buildings actually? Have they really grown and developed in this very location? Um, when I was traveling around the Baltic for research purposes, I've seen so many similarities. The despite the Baltic Sea area is quite big and there are of course cultural differences. <coughs> um, so, um, and a lot of these farmstead researchers told me that no, these buildings really have nothing to do with each other. Totally different building, totally different typology, but actually they look super similar and they look, they're using the same materials. They're re reacting in a very similar way to the climate. So is this then a climatic convergence? Uh, climatic convergence occur when the same type of building style is being developed in uh, geographically independent locations due to the same environmental conditions. And an example would be some of these earthen architecture in Tunis or in China. So they have developed totally apart from each other in a, in a very similar way. I don't know if we have that here. <coughs> so some, some researchers in the past have also stumbled upon this phenomenon and have wondered if some of the, like there was a, a Swedish researcher, Albert Eskeret, who was traveling from southern Sweden to Pomerania and was uh, struck by the similarities of uh, farmsteads. And he was wondering, is this a question of migration or, or, or of local development? If you look at the map, of course, these places are not exactly far away from each other, but it's different countries and different, uh, different cultural circles. So yeah. It was certainly envi environmental parameters who have led to a similar design. On the other hand, if we look at the history of the Baltic Sea reason, region, we know that apart from a lively exchange of goods across the sea, there was also cultural exchange. If we look at different places around the Baltic, we are also looking at the dynamic history of shifting borders. Um, the island I come from has been Swedish for a long time, then Danish, then German. There's also been a lot of Slavic influence. So of course this also had an influence on building style as people migrated or moved around and they often took their building knowledge or skills with them. So it's hard to say 
really? Is this a, a vernacular building that just grew out of one place? Because there are, of course, a number of influences uh, that determine the design of a building. And this is not only climate conditions or environmental parameters, but also the economic background of a person who built a house, his personal preferences, even building regulations existed in the past. Um, the size of his farm, does, did he have a lot of land or did, was he poor? And um, the also conditions of soil and so forth. So a lot of things have actually determined the shape of a building. I would like to show, show you one example of uh, a topology from the Southern Baltic that I have worked with a lot now and that I have dedic dedicated actually to, to seminars um, that I was teaching. Um, this typology is called the German Hall House and it's a barn by a dwelling house that is essentially uh, a whole farm under one big roof. It is characterized by a large central space. You can see it up there, it's the, the place called Dale. Um, where people were working, sitting, eating, threshing the harvest, there was a central fireplace and when it was harvest time, the carriage uh, could drive into the hall and could be unloaded, protected from wind and rain. Behind the hall there was a small, so the hall is the dale part, there was a small living part um, and there's actually also a drive-through version of these houses so the, the uh, carriage could drive in on one side and drive out on the other side. Um, this Hall house is actually originating from Holland and it arrived with a wave of settlers in northern Germany in the 13th century. So these ex settlers took this building typology with them. The typology makes sense when considering the Dutch North Sea climate uh, because working outside, outside is often impossible. It is raining uh, all the time and it's very stormy. Um, and the, the harvest had to be put in a dry place very quickly before it started raining again. Um, but it is quite interesting because it, as it was spreading eastwards along the Baltic coast when the influence of the Atlantic climate gets less and less, the Hall House also started to change and become smaller, but then there were additional barn buildings next to it. So you could really see an, a, a development um, that had to do with the climate very much. There's actually, so these houses really spread very far up into where it is uh, Dansk in Poland now. Uh, to be able to identify underlying climate responsive design pr principles, I have developed a kind of research matrix which is still and constantly work in progress. Um, but I, I have tested this matrix with, uh, within two seminars while teaching architecture students uh, at the Potsdam School of Architecture but also Brandenburg Technical University. So this is a picture from one of these seminars, we had a lot of fun. Um, and some of the results I would like to show you now. This matrix is actually, uh, maybe you can't really see it so much now, but it's focusing on the main climate elements, wind, sun, precipitation, humidity and temperature. And the question how architecture has protected itself from this climate, but also how it has made use of it. Uh, we looked at uh, case studies in uh, northern Germany bordering to Denmark. In this area you can find a rich mix of different typologies and variations of it. Um, farms that researchers in the area are still somehow fighting over the question which typology belongs to who. I don't think that actually matters so much. Luckily we're Europe now, we don't have to think about that any longer and we can concentrate on the more important issues like the climate. So these actually are two examples of apparently two different typologies that to me, I don't know, look quite similar. But maybe I'm not an ethnologist. Um, first we have looked at the, the, sorry this is still a bit in German so I didn't have time to translate it but I will run you through it. Um, first we have looked at the setting of, uh, of the settlement but also buildings within the landscape. Um, 
what I found is that as architects we have to start developing an eye again for these kind of things as we move through our built environment. Um, together with the students we have looked at the topography of the site of vegetation close by and how vegetation was placed or actually how it was made use of maybe existing forests. Um, one dominating factor, of course, is the wind in the Baltic Sea area and how these settlements have been placed with regards to wind directions um, and how maybe trees could break wind speeds or how topography could break wind speeds. Um, topography was considered often in hiding in lower areas of the landscape behind small hills or protected, yeah, protected from the wind. So sometimes you could actually hardly find these settlements. There's an, an image of one of these hidden places and some of the sort of principles of how wind moves through topography that we have looked at and analyzed. Of course, generally, uh, and wherever possible, settlements would not have been laid out in very wind-exposed areas. Usually tops of hills were avoided where wind speeds are the highest and houses were not built directly into valleys or lower laying areas where cold air or fog would be pooling. And creating microclimate is a big topic in all these case studies and enhancing the quality also of outdoor spaces. And um, there's some of these case studies that we analyzed. We looked at the wind directions for every month of the year. Um, and then we looked at where, where this wind is coming from and where maybe even the garden is located with regards to these wind directions so it is protected and where there are areas that are not windy and maybe a few degrees warmer where we could work or sit or something. Um, we have found that actually with all of these case studies buildings were oriented according to the predominating wind directions really mostly all of them. Um, so this is an example from a small little island also in the southern Baltic um, usually buildings were placed with a short side against the wind. Um, maybe you can't see it really on this map. This is from the, the I think, 17th or 16th century when, the Swed when this area was Swedish and the uh, Swedish surveyors came and surveyed the island. So you could already see how these, all these buildings were lined up just behind each other like a, like a necklace of pearls, just uh, and all these buildings standing in lines. But what they're actually also doing, they're not standing directly behind each other, but they're jumping in and out. So in between you get little pockets of green and where you could have a garden and, and, and sit. So it's, it's quite an interesting um, layout or example. Um, where, wherever there were settlements or farmsteads consisting of more buildings, they were placed in a way to create protected areas of microclimates and often this happened in the shape of uh, closed courtyards or more or less closed courtyards. So this is a, a plan from a little village on a Danish island, Nyord, and uh, these are some of the principles that we looked at, um, how the wind would, if, depending on the size of a courtyard, how the wind would actually just blow across and when it is wider when the wind starts diving into the courtyard and transports some of the air out of it and yeah so we have analyzed um, these these ones as well. Um, and super windy areas of course we have observed that these farmsteads were completely closed. The further we move inland they start opening up and become single buildings sort of grouped um, like that on that side. And this is uh, an example from Jutland, also Denmark. So this is the North Sea side. So you see it's very windy and there's also a, a, the middle one as showing the trees that are growing there and how they look like. So you get these trees that are really um, growing like that because of the wind. And this is also where the buildings are completely closed. And here trees look kind of normal again. <laughs> And we have a, a sort of closed courtyards, but just with single buildings. <coughs> but we also find very sort of um, special uh, uh, layouts. This is from uh, another island in the southern Baltic, Fehmarn. And uh, 
this is also where the German Hall House is predominating, which is usually because it's just it's a farm under one roof. It's usually a standalone building, but in these villages in Feynman, they have grouped six, over six, of these houses in two parallel lines, and never more. Always six, not seven, eight, or anything. They, if there was, if the village was growing, they would start a new one. And these villages, they were always really uh, orientated by the wind. This is a map of Feynman and with a predominant wind direction and sometimes it's, it's different but that has to do with a hill or something that was just in front. But this was very in, a very interesting example of uh, layout and it is thought that this had to do with um, because people in this island came up with a democratic village structure so they even had a kind of uh, law. So this was a, a sort of communal area in the middle of these in between these parallel lines of houses. So um, <coughs> I've talked a, a lot about protecting from wind, but of course people have also utilized the wind, for example, for cross ventilation through settlements or farmstead structures. So buildings or openings in these courtyard, um, farms, or closed courtyard farmsteads, they were placed in a way so if you could open certain doors, you could uh, like sort of steer how the wind would ventilate through these farms. And the same goes for buildings. I mean, this, I think, I don't know if you have these doors here as well, the, the doors that can have an opening that, that are sort of, uh, split in the middle, that you could open the top and let some air out and not have the whole door open. And so you could, this has other functions too, but um, of course, ventilation. Uh, was also considered. And <laughs> one really wonders why people need tumble dryers in the Baltic Sea area. Um, when I do my laundry on the island I live, I, it takes about 20 minutes. I can put it up, take a cup of coffee and take it down again, zero energy used. And I think um, this may maybe sound funny, but I think that it is all these small things um, that we have to start being more consequent with um, and they all add up to maybe and if everyone does it it could probably help um, making a difference and for architects with, when I show this to students they think oh yeah of course but of course when we design housing developments and we design laundry rooms, do we really should not also design places where you could dry your laundry outside and save energy? When it comes to the, the design of the buildings, their shape, their volume, uh, the most aerodynamic shape is obviously best that it lessens the impact of wind forces onto the building structure. This is an example from, from Denmark as well, where you could see that even the roof, the thatched roof is very like rounded, all the edges are rounded, um, there's hardly any roof overhang, so the wind can't grip underneath and uh, cause damage. And uh, the architect, the Swedish architect, Ralph Erskine, he's been uh, looking at these aerodynamic, aerodynamic shaped buildings as well in some of his uh, research. Of course, a, a lot of damage occurs when storm is having an impact on building parts that are projecting out, like even chimneys were avoided because of that, because the wind could just like work on that and after some years you so suddenly get some damage. Um, so especially close to the sea we hardly see any roof overhangs in the southern Baltic area. It might be different here in Estonia. I haven't really uh, managed to look at that. But um, so obviously the, the, the flusher uh, shape of a building is the better and the lesser damage will occur. Coming back to the, the case study of the German Hall House, um, we see that in very windy areas, like the island I come from, the, the roof actually almost reaches down all the way to the ground, making the building especially aerodynamic. And this way the wind can't hit the walls in a 90 degree angle with the most impact. So in, in this area, these houses are called sugar cone houses. So like just, it's just a cone really. And they're also uh, so-called roof-only houses. Uh, and the interesting thing is that um, 
there's only one other place where the hall house would uh, end up or was, would have this shape and this is in its orangi origin in the Netherlands, in one corner of the Netherlands in northern Holland where the North Sea storms hit the coast, this is also um, uh, um, it's a variation that has the same shape. As we observed, most buildings were placed facing the wind with a short side first. And we have often found that in these parts of the building, the dimensions of the timber structure was bigger than in the other end of the building. Um, so, so that means that the load bearing structure was customized to the wind direction. And if you will, f uh, for the very location of the building to be, meet, to be able to meet higher wind loads. I don't know, you can't probably see it in, it, in, in this drawing and it's very small, but the sections of the wood in that corner where the wind would hit were bigger than on the other side and sometimes there was extra support. Um, and also quite often the roof is reaching far, you can see it in this image here, it's reaching down lower uh, and then in the, well, on the other side. So this would be the side with the predominant wind direction. So it was actually uh, a strategy where that was very material efficient. So today we just use one dimension for the timber structure everywhere in the whole house, but they were just using the dimension that needed where the wind would hit, and on the other side they could save some material. A very uh, sort of interesting observation was also made with regards to the, the roof or the timber structure of the roof of these hall houses in some places, which was described by the German researcher Zimmermann. Some of the rafters and beams in the roof structure are not rigid uh, or not tightly connected to other parts of the structure. So they're sometimes just lying on top of each other and they have a little bit of a, what do you call it? Um, flexibility, so they could just, it's a bit similar to uh, earthquake proof building, so the, some rafters could just slide across as the wind hits. So the, the roof was actually had a bit of flexibility in itself when the wind was hitting, so the impact wouldn't cause as much damage, so that the structure could actually just react a little bit to the wind. Of course, also the thatched roofs of the hall, hall house are holding some certain flexibility in itself because of the material. The whole roof can react a little bit more flexibly to temporary deformation because of the layered structures of the reed bundles. And so the material is a bit like, you can maybe imagine that it could just, uh, you know, move a little bit with the wind. The lifespan of thatched roofs, given good maintenance, can be up to 100 years, so much longer than conventional roofing materials. It can also be sourced locally and of course it's fully compostable, which is an interesting aspect nowadays that we use a lot of composite materials. <coughs> so simple detailing, simple constructions are crucial for longer lifespans of buildings as they can be repaired easily and can be recycled on the contra contrary to these composite materials. When it comes to wind, the effect of convective heat loss is a problem, as, of course, as well, especially in very windy areas. So the, the side of the, the facade that is exposed to the predominant wind direction is losing a lot of heat from this convective heat uh, transfer. So it, it is not, if I don't want to be too scientific now, it basically draws the energy from the surface of the external wall. Um, what people have done is to insulate these wind exposed walls with an extra layer. Sometimes they have used reed um, put against the wall, but just actually on the side that was needed, not on the other sides. So it's also another bespoke solution where they would just really use the material they needed for that very side that's usually wind exposed. Of course, wind uh, can also use uh, cause a lot of damage to windows and doors that are being left open or that are being pushed open through draft. And around the Baltic windows used to be opening outwards most of the time, so the wind will shut them close when it hits the, the building, uh, avoiding damages um, to them, but also avoiding a draft in the building. For some reason in Northern Germany now, um, we only have inward opening windows because the construction industry is not really so interested in selling different types of windows in one market and we, uh, it's very strange because it doesn't really work where we live. Um, coming back to the case study of the Hall House, it has a very 
a smart strategy when it comes to flooding. Um, flooding will also, it's also prognosed to occur more often in the future. Um, so this building originating from Holland, where we have a lot of flooding, of course, because of the, the uh, geography, landscape of the, uh, um, yeah. So t what happens when the, the storm is hitting, or the storm flood is hitting this house? The actual load bearing structure of these buildings is on the inside. You can see this like table, like uh, wooden structure. Um, and the outer walls, are not load bearing, they're just uh, very simple, uh, they don't have any function at all really, apart from just being the, the envelope of the building. So when the flood is hitting the building, these outer walls could take the first impact and collapse and the inner structure which would be protected from the first impact of the flood. So what people would do is they would climb up onto the first level of the house and Water would, might be flowing around in the house, but when the water would rinse again, they could come down and repair the outer walls and done. So the actual house would just stay and the roof would stay, of course, because the roof is resting on this um, structure in the middle. <coughs> there are so many aspects related to wind, um, but I'm afraid I won't be able to go into detail with this within this short time frame. Um, Bioclimatic design princi principles are, however, another very interesting aspect as they are the foundation of climatic architecture, actually. So with regards to wind, wind chill is something that we all have all experienced ourselves. And we are, if we are exposed to wind, the outside temperature feels much colder than it actually is. Um, this has to do with evaporation on the surface of our skins. So if we design buildings or housing developments in very windy areas, we have to consider creating wind protected spaces where people can meet, sit, work, play, where, where communal life is happening. Um, and this should actually really be happening in the early design stage instead of fixing problems afterwards and putting up fences because then we realize, oh, it's windy here, I can't really sit, so I have to go to the building supplies market, buy an ugly fence and uh, put it somewhere. Um, and this Danish office, thanks to Van Kunsten, has uh, looked a lot into vernacular architecture and has taken some principles from uh, Danish farmsteads and have created this housing development and these buildings have a lot of these little pockets and corners and courtyards that are um, making uh, life a lot more comfortable in that area. Another major climate element uh, of course to be considered is the sun. The sun has the most influence on our climate. So if we carefully design new buildings we can harvest significant amounts of solar energy in the shape of thermal energy. Or, uh, or sunlight for natural lighting. So with the students, we have um, analyzed the sun um, um, for certain locations where these case, case studies were located. And we have analyzed how much solar energy occurs in one place. Uh, we have studied sun path diagrams and um, we have studied traditional buildings with regards to the orientations towards the sun. And here you can maybe see an example at what angle the sun is reaching a building during several times of the year. Um, of course, the sun, the, the amount of solar radiation um, depends on different things. Um, it has to do with maybe cloud cover. Of course, when it's cloudy, we don't get as much sun. It's not no news. Um, and, um, but of course, for us in the northern climate, we don't have so much of an overheating problem by sun radiation as other parts in the world have that where, where studies into local architecture really are more into how can we deal with the heat and the sun. For us, the, the, um, the average temperature outside in most of the Baltic Sea region is only in a comfortable range for a few weeks during the year and um, might get hotter with climate change, but we are actually more interested in harvesting thermal energy through solar radiation for most of the year. Be yeah, and because of all these factors, like maybe there's a tree in, in front of the house, there's a forest, maybe there's other buildings, it is very hard to measure the, the amount of solar energy that we can gain. So there's no general, general uh, figure that we can retrieve some from somewhere. 
So when looking at these case studies of traditional buildings, most windows or bigger openings were oriented towards the south, obviously to let as much sun in as possible into the dwelling part, and floor plans were organized accordingly. But of course, it is not uh, so simple because the positioning of openings in the facade and where they are is also a, a principle that varies with different locations around the Baltic. There is a, a complex interaction in between architectural responses to different climate elements when people had to prioritize responding to some climate elements over others. With the case studies in northern Germany and the predominant wind direction from west, buildings could be orientated with their short side towards the wind, that is west, and the long facade facing south. But this doesn't always work out in other places, so um, people had to look and compromise uh, these climate factors. Trees were often placed in front of buildings in a way so they could give some shade in summer, but in winter when they lose their leaves and let, they could let the sun into the building. With some case studies we found that windows were placed in the facade in the way that they were shadowed by a roof overhang uh, during lunchtime or in summer when you didn't want the sun reaching into the building but let the lower standing sun in the morning or evening or in winter let the, uh, that it can penetrate deep into the building and reach really the, the far end of the, the room behind it as well. <coughs> On the left side, this is an interesting example from Sweden of a farmstead where you see a central courtyard and in the north there's the dwelling part of the building. This is a timber frame construction and all around it you have a, a stone, natural stone walls for the, the, the barn and the buyer. And in the central part there would be a microclimate, so the space would heat up and be a few degrees warmer. And also the south-facing facade could let a lot of this warm air in from both the um, warmer courtyard but also the sun, because the, the facade is, is not so thick. So, of course, solar energy has to also travel through the building envelope to be able to warm the building. So, there it works quite nicely, I think. Um, the Albedo effect describes the percentage of incoming radiation reflected by a surface. So, white glossy surfaces tend to reflect radiation, whereas dark surfaces can absorb radiations. And so um, a lot of these old buildings have, of course, made use of the effect of certain materials heating up quicker or slower in, uh, when the sun reaches them. So you can see if you maybe pave a courtyard in darker granite stones, they will heat up very nicely during the day and, give and radiate the heat over a long period back into the building. But also the paint or the treatment of certain materials and certain colors has, has had a function. <coughs> so maybe um, if you paint certain materials lighter, you don't want them to heat up as quick, which might make the material react and crack if the, if, uh, the temperature changes happen too quickly. Of course, we have also studied um, natural lighting and we have looked at um, how how we have to place the windows in the facade so we reach the most natural light into the room. Uh, precipitation um, occurs in very many shapes. <coughs> we have seen actually a lot of damages from hailstorms recently where I come from, which wasn't so common before and this could really cause a lot of um, really um, strong damage. As I said, we will also see more severe weather with um, climate change and um, so we have to uh, think about our roofing materials and the roofs um, um, and especially the angles of the roof with regards to their material. I don't know if this is a principle in the north of the Baltic because I'm just looking at that now, but I, in, in southern Germany, of course, the, the layer of snow was also used as an insulating layer. As I said, there are, um, in some windy areas, larger roof overhangs have been avoided because of the wind that could sort of um, make, take damage to them. So people have come up with different solutions of uh, um, protecting the facade of the buildings from washing out 
by putting up little devices, I would call them, or little boards or things, so the rain would not uh, hit the facade in the same way. This is an example from Denmark too. Of course, when the, the rainwater arrives at ground, it needs to be drained away from the building as soon as possible. So this was a very nice, uh, um, sort of simple vernacular way of just using natural stones, forming little uh, gutters to, to sort of lead the water away from the buildings. Temperature would be the next climate element. In the north, where it is uncomfortably cold most of the year, heating our buildings is using up a significant amount of energy. Therefore, when we were examining several case studies with the students, we have looked at various climate responsive energy saving strategies, but also energy winning strategies that could work in our climate around the Baltic. Before I'm coming to those, I would like to highlight one thing that we have probably uh, forgotten about that it's actually not summer when it's winter. So one main feature of our climate is seasonality and we are getting to use uh, heating our flats to 25 degrees or more, walking around in t-shirts and barefoot at home when it's snowing outside. So climate conscious living might also mean a lifestyle change and to realize that we have to stop doing that and that we should live according to the seasons more. <laughs> It is actually perf perfectly all right, to my mind, to put a pair of socks on and sit together uh, with the family in winter around a fireplace or similar. Um, and in summer we can maybe spend more time outside like we used to do, uh, making use of the bright and long evenings, maybe even cooking outside. And this is not only climate conscious, but actually also a, a, maybe a beautiful continuation of local building traditions and ways of living. Talking about seasonality, one important climate responsive strategy, of course, is seasonal living. With most of the case studies, we have observed the different use of the buildings throughout the seasons. To sum it up, people have used less space in winter, because they had to heat them, than the summer in order to save energy. So this is uh, some floor plans from Sweden and the, the red um, areas within the dwelling parts are marking the amount of space that was used or lived in, in winter and the blue one, the ones that were used in summer. And this is an example from uh, a French office, La Caton Vassal, that have looked a lot into these uh, principles of seasonality, seasonal living, and how we could maybe use these climate uh, responsive strategies in modern architecture. Um, another principle would be flexible rooms um, this is a space-saving strategy uh, as such um, that we might also question the use of certain spaces or if one room could not contain more functions than one. Uh, it also means that we design flats in a way that the floor plan is flexible, that we can split rooms when a family grows and so on. This might lead to the fact that people can stay in their places longer and adjust their flats or houses according to their needs instead of moving out and building a new place and so forth. So, of course, also smaller and multifunctional spaces use less energy. <coughs> it is also super important to design compact buildings with the best possible surface to volume ratio as heat losses increases with bigger surfaces. I mean, that's kind of, uh, everyone knows that, but no one really does that so much. Um, the bigger a building, the more heat can be stored and uh, released slower, so it's more efficient to build one big building instead of various smaller ones. Um, it also makes uh, sense to organize floor plans with different temperature zones whereby the outer ones can function as a buffer. So we would have maybe a, a really warm central space and, uh, and then we could organize it similar to an onion. We could uh, organize rooms that have a lower temperature, maybe bedrooms around that in a ring. Um, and this is the Hall House, the, the case study, is using this very much because it has the central space and all around we have the living part, but also uh, places where the, the kettle was. So the kettle was heating as well, so it had an insulating layer of stables around the living space. And I think the, the example that I've seen here in, in Estonia with this central kiln room that has its own uh, room inside the house is obviously the same 
climate responsive strategy. And the central heat source, of course, is um, another strategy that could radiate heat evenly into the building and not be in one corner and nothing reaches the other end of it. So that would be a strategy that we have observed in very many of these vernacular buildings. Then we should also consider the building in section, room heights, but also, of course, the higher a room, the more space you have to heat, and the lower the room, the quicker you can heat it, the less energy you need. But what's going on top? Is there maybe a, an insulating another room, like they had in the hall house, where they were stacking the hay on top of the central space, so obviously the heat could not escape to the, through the top. And this is an, tr an interesting typology from Blekinge in Sweden, where the different functions of the parts of the buildings also had different ceiling heights, so they were just um, adjusting it accordingly. Uh, another strategy would be sun-shaped buildings. We don't have so many examples of that, but in where we are, the, the best angle or the most efficient angle for the sun to reach a surface would be 45 degrees. So if we should try to uh, shape buildings in that way, we could gain the most energy. And another, coming to the end now, another um, vernacular um, energy winning strategy would be uh, sun spaces and a lot of the buildings around the Baltic have these little sun spaces in front of their buildings where this could be in the shape of verandas, so little porches that are south facing and that would heat <coughs> up easier than the building uh, itself. So the heat that accumulates or the, the warm air that accumulates in these sun spaces could then um, flow into the rest of the building and heat that as well. So if you have a veranda and it heats up, you open the door and you can let the warm air go into the building. So this, is, this has just been a, a very short sort of glimpse into the work or research that I'm doing and I think I have to close here. Um, but I hope I could transport the idea a bit of making use of these climate responsive principles again today as to present concrete and simple strategies that we know have worked for a long period of time in these <laughs> locations for both energy saving and climate responsive building. And for me as an architect, this is also a valuable method of creating architecture that is much better rooted in its place. Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I think that th there are so many um, <coughs> aspects in these buildings that are presenting a, a passive strategies that can optimize a building so much that we can that we only have to top them up with lesser technology for them to work best in one certain place. So I think that's why it makes a building um, more efficient in one sense, but maybe also on an architectural level for me it's a uh, they present a way of, or they present buildings that um, can provide living spaces that work for the area. So we can maybe live how we live in this seasonal climate. We can live, um, maybe in Estonia you have uh, certain functions that have a lot to do with the local climate, like saunas maybe, or summer kitchens that are nice, uh, or very interesting, not only nice, very interesting, uh, both strategies, but also cultural aspects. And I think a lot of these uh, vernacular strategies are not only just climate responsive or just energy efficient, but they hold everything, uh, they hold cultural aspects. So I think that's that's why it makes maybe architecture that is based on these principles very valuable. And um, if it's a market question, I don't know, but of course, uh, yes, I think, yeah. So, <coughs> I have another comment from the veranda. It's also very good as a wind start. Yes. And if you're uh, entering a, well, in Estonia we usually have more of an enclosed veranda, yes. with glass or something like that. So it's a buffer of space mm -hmm. that offers like, uh, a colder area maybe, mm -hmm. but where you can take your boots off or something like that, and then enter the living space. Yeah. That, that, that helps to
to save the indoor heat and yeah. evaporate as well. Yeah. But my question was more about uh, mm, the stability of these uh, uh, climate responsive mm, solutions. Mm -hmm. So they have developed over a long time mm -hmm. in a relatively stable climate. Mm -hmm. And that is why they work well, mm -hmm. because the climate is stable. If we mm -hmm. move on mm -hmm. to the situation mm -hmm. where the climate is not so stable, mm -hmm. then they become less useful? This is my question. Yeah, I think the climate actually hasn't been so super stable all the time. So we had highs and lows in the past centuries as well. And these buildings have always sort of worked their way through, through it somehow. But I think if we, uh, for me it's also interesting to look at maybe the, the northern part of the Baltic and the southern part of the Baltic, and if we say maybe the temperature increases by one or two degrees, we can maybe see, okay, what did they do in the, the southern Baltic to, to deal with that? And we're not far away from that. So could we maybe just adapt or get, maybe get an idea what we could do without um, changing everything completely? So I think we can learn from different principles and because they all are quite similar, but there are just slight variations. Yeah, I think that's um, what I think, for example, if we know it will be coming a lot more windy, um, we can maybe have to decrease the roof overhang a little bit. So, um, and it's not going to change the appearance or the, the vernacular architecture completely, but they are just small tweaks that still could make it work, I guess, yeah. So, you had a tour yesterday. Yeah. So for your first impressions on the Estonian vernacular architecture, how does that, what the elements struck your mind, and uh, yeah. how does that fit, fit into your general ideas? Well, I got, uh, of course, I mean, I, I had read up about Estonian architecture before and literature, but I think seeing it is a totally different thing. And I think that's why these open air museums are uh, uh, very uh, fantastic sources for knowledge. And uh, just by going there, feeling it, seeing it, touching it, everything, you you start to understand uh, buildings much better. And I think I was really interested in the central kiln room because I hadn't really realized it before and see this mess of a stove in it is, uh, is a fantastic element, I think, to be considered with a, with a central heat source and um, something can radiate and release heat slowly. And I think that's an, it's a very interesting principle that should be maybe um, de yeah, developed further f to match today's uh, requirements. Yeah. So, mm. You said at the start that there is a bad practice to blindly copy yeah. these elements of uh, vernacular architecture yeah. because they didn't, might not work as they yeah. were intended because they were content uh, 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 relative to the context, is yeah. what, what makes them tick. Yeah. At the same time, you said you're developing a toolkit. In my yeah. mind, a toolkit is like a set of forms, maybe even principles, mm -hmm. but how, what is the process of using or putting into uh, into design? Uh, yeah. It's not blind copying, mm -hmm. but then what is it? Well, I think maybe if you take the example of maybe master planning uh, or urban planning um, of space, uh, places or settlement or housing developments, the, it could help to look at the layout of older settlements and how they have been organized and laid out and um, not copying it but reconsidering the strategies that are lying within those in, in terms of coping with wind, in terms of creating microclimate and I think that's that's the tool where, where I would maybe say okay uh, use uh, courtyard structures with a dimension of A times B because this seemed to have worked very well in this climate. So I think that would be the, the, the tool, the, the strategy to, to apply. Or um, we have used this type of trees in that distance to the buildings because they have been provided shadow or they have been 
stop the wind or so this could be a, a strategy and it's uh, vegetation is also very interesting because a lot of these old buildings have always worked to, together with veg vegetation it was just not the building as such but whatever came with it these old farms if you look at them they're totally ingrown they they always work with vegetation a lot and taking uh, advantage of the of it somehow Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let us know uh, when your work is done. So yes, I will. <laughs> I'll come back then. <laughs> okay.